Hello everybody. Welcome to a special program that the Hardwick Gazette and HCTV are jointly doing to bring you interviews of the candidates in Vermont's primary election. The primary this year is August 13th. We'll be interviewing all the candidates in four Senate districts and five House districts that the 11 towns of the Hardwick Gazette are uh, represented by. So, You'll be able to watch these at hctv.us or read them at hardwickgazette.org and each uh, place will be linked to the other. So we'll bring you now interviews of your local candidates. Thanks for watching. I live in Woolcat with my wife, Amy, and um, we have two adult children. Um, I am the director of the Vermont Association of Senior Centers and Meal Providers is my other job. And um, I have been serving in the legislature since 2017. I serve on the Human Services Committee and work a lot with the issues that affect older Vermonters. Um, we have just uh, passed um, or we've just created the um, Age Strong Vermont, which is the Vermont long-term plan for aging well. And there's a lot of important initiatives within this plan that we've been working on um, that I would like to work on implementing. We're looking at housing, we're looking at access to services for older Vermonters so that they can stay in their homes and their communities, making sure that the agencies that provide services to them have the funding they need to be able to hire staff, and to provide those services, whether it's home health or um, Meals on Wheels programs. Um, I also um, am really interested in um, how we're gonna work around um, education funding and looking at how um, we utilize the money that we already have in the system to be able to provide education to our children um, and figure out how we can keep our um, communities affordable for both um, our working Vermonters, older Vermonters, um, and make sure young people stay here. Um, I have been working um, on the um, Office of the Child Advocate um, and want to continue making sure that they have the tools that they need to be able to help youth in the custody of the state transition to adulthood. Um, it's a bill that I've worked on for a number of years and created this position in state government to just really be an intermediary between DCF and children who um, are in the custody of the state. Um, I am a Wilkett resident and live on a farm in Wilkett uh, with my partner, Katie. Um, we are part-time farmers and, and grow some blueberries and greenhouse tomatoes and grass-fed beef. Um, I am recently retired from the state of Vermont Agency of Natural Resources, where I worked for about 25 years, um, doing water quality work, watershed assessment, restoration, uh, flood resilience uh, projects. The last eight years of my career with the state, um, I ran a municipal road stormwater program. It was a statewide program. It was a, a one-person uh, program and covered all 250 towns um, and established that program from scratch and ran that program uh, essentially by myself. And, and um, before my career, uh, before working for the state, I worked for the federal government uh, with the USDA um, in Franklin Grand Isle County as a soil conservationist and uh, working with farmers uh, doing natural resource planning and water quality projects on their farms. Um, I served two years with uh, Bill Clinton's uh, AmeriCorps program, uh, the first uh, program in Vermont in the early 90s uh, for two years, and um, I worked for Vermont Fish and Wildlife as well, started my career as a summer job with Vermont Fish and Wildlife, and I'm also a, a proud Johnson State College alum. Uh, I have uh, I've worked in the construction business since 1977. I worked in heavy construction and more recently in residential construction. And uh, 
you know, I've I've watched Vermont go from a, a really neat place to live with a really interesting and unique culture to the situation that it's in now. And uh, I think much of that culture has been lost. And there, I just, uh, there's too much emphasis on, on regulation um, and taxation. So um, I'd like to try to preserve uh, what's left of the culture in Vermont. And so that's how come I'm running for, for this house seat. And uh, generally when I do something, I work real hard at it. And uh, then I'm willing to put in the effort for our state. Thank you for having me tonight. I, my name's Richard Bailey, and I have been a resident in the town of Hyde Park for 31 years. My background has been mostly in the energy field. I've sold propane, coal, electric, fuel oil, and I think that that part of that, pers that um, background will give me some insight to, sh to work with these people down there in Montpelier regarding taxes on fuels, et cetera. They, I don't think a lot of those people in the legislature really know the whole industry. And therefore, I would like my background would be able to help these people out. And it's just been um, the sustainable. My taxes this year just went up $900. And this is an unsustainable path for everybody in this state. And we need to uh, find a way to bring some of this stuff under control. It's just getting completely out of hand. So since I have um, been in the legislature since 2017, I've been introducing legislation that really looks at how we fund our schools and, and more importantly, the fact that um, our school systems, we have 51 supervisory unions, and I proposed having 16 supervisory unions drawn around our technical and career centers because having this overhead um, and the ability is very expensive. Um, we really should be looking at how to reduce costs. So if you look at the yield bill that we just um, passed, I did not support that because it only increased revenue and it didn't talk about reducing costs. So the proposal that I have put forward um, basically uh, creates 16 supervisory unions, each drawn around a tech center. They um, are um, um, and then what I'd like to also do is, as part of this, is to um, um, have some sort of oversight. So, in other words, each of these supervisory unions would um, put forth a budget that they create with their uh, school boards. And then those 16 budgets would be reviewed to see what's in them and how different supervisor unions are spending on different things um, and try to figure out how to reduce costs, um, not only at the administration level, but right down through, but still be able to look at how much schools are spending on each child and what the education outcomes are. Uh, that yeah, that that's a probably one of the hardest uh, nuts to crack in the state in my mind. And I've been on only been on about a month and a half. And full disclaimer, I'm still developing my positions, um, doing my homework, doing my research, and learning about all the important issues impacting my district and the rest of the state. And I've been meeting with different organizations and nonprofits and directors of some of these organizations, um, doing a lot of reading, talking to um, other representatives and senators. Uh, I met with Susan Bartlett um, and Dan Noyes yes, just yesterday morning to talk about some of these issues and get some of their thoughts on how do we approach some of these really tough issues like uh, property tax and school funding. Uh, my colleague, Dan Noyes, um, who I'm, I'm just honored to run with, He's been a great mentor so far, and uh, he has some great ideas about the school funding, uh, including potentially reducing the amount of supervisory unions uh, from the dozens that we have now down to uh, wrapping them around the, um, the tech schools in, in the state, like Lamoille Union, for example, and, and reducing them to reduce some of the administrative costs. I think that's a really good idea. The 14% uh, property tax increase that that was a, approved last session 
would have been uh, unacceptable to me and I would have voted against it. Uh, but I, I think we have to get to the cost, get to the transportation costs with schools, uh, with some of the teacher benefits, uh, class size, uh, and, and again, the supervisor union question. I think those are some, some if we get to, to the bottom of those, and, and a lot of things, honestly, may not be able to be addressed at the state level, uh, but they, they have to be addressed at the local level. Uh, so there's, there needs to be some uh, changes at the local level as well. School spending in, in Vermont is just completely out of control. Uh, I was reading an opinion piece in the Stowe Reporter this afternoon, actually. It was from a week or so ago. But uh, the gentleman pointed out that Vermont leads the nation in the number of adults per student in its schools. And we've been told for decades now that the secret to good education is to spend more money. And I have pointed out to my, some of my friends on the left that, well, you know, they do a pretty good job of educating kids in places in China and India where they don't have big fancy schools like we have here and have made the case that perhaps the school building isn't really the secret to success in teaching kids arithmetic. And so, um, the, the, you know, as I said, the spending is, is out of control. There's too many people in the schools. And I think we need to really have a, 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 a broad look at education because as we've been spending more and more money, there's less and less students. And disturbingly, we're now seeing that our, that our grade scores are not, are not rising. And so clearly, we're not doing something right. And so I'd like to have a look at the whole, the whole issue, the funding issue and the education issue. Education is a cornerstone of our country. We need it. And so I'm not adverse to paying for it, but I am adverse to destructive taxation like we have now. So unfortunately, um, I, I, don't think, I don't think my friends in the Democrat Party are, are going to be able to address that problem. Um, this, the teachers union has become so powerful in this state that I don't think there's anything more powerful in this state other than the state itself. That is a tough subject and it's one that's going to need a lot of uh, negotiations and discussions with both sides to try to figure out, including the teachers union. We've got to get some give and take. We can't be building these buildings. It's always been my philosophy that buildings don't teach kids, buildings build empires. And our scores are dropping. We've been, I've been in situations on the school board where we've had the negotiating team for the teachers say we need more money. And we say, well, the, the test scores are going down. And they say, well, give us more money and the test scores will go up and the test scores don't go up. Uh, a new funding source, we just need to look at the whole thing. I think Act 60 just kind of put, put all the money in the state control where it was more control prior to that on the local level. So... Um, I'm not, I don't object to paying for it, but I think maybe if we inject some school choice and some competition into the system, we might uh, get a little give and take with the unions and the teachers and, and try to let's get back to the um, main curriculum of reading, writing, and, and math, science, and those are the things we should be stressing because we're not meeting those standards out there now. So one of the things that rural Vermont is really lacking is access to housing for older Vermonters. We don't have the infrastructure in our village centers and downtowns to really support that in a lot of communities. But the ones that do, we should be looking at how to remove barriers to allow the development of age specific housing in our in our village centers. What this will do is we have a lot of um, older Vermonters living out in rural parts of our state that, um, you know, have been in their homes for a long time. Maybe they raised families there. And now they're at a point where access to transportation, the maintenance and keeping up one of these homes is is really hard, hard to do. Um, and so if there was access to uh, housing in the village centers and downtowns, in their communities, 
they would have the opportunity to possibly move there. Um, keeping ties with their social connections, their families that live in the communities. And this would open up housing stock um, that is currently um, not available. Um, you know, I bought an old farmhouse years ago from somebody and have spent 20 years working on it because it was in pretty rough shape. But having um, a place for people to move because right now we don't. So a lot of people are just stuck. I mean, they could sell their house and we'll hit up on East Hill, for example, but they are not going to have a place to go within our community that would be available to them around age-specific housing. Um, this last legislative session, we invested $30 million in the Vermont Housing Conservation Board to really look at the development of affordable and mixed housing, uh, mixed income housing um, so hopefully those dollars will um, help create this age-specific housing, especially in rural Vermont. That's like one of the hardest things because, you know, our population definitely is in Chittenden County. And so I'm constantly really pushing on the fact that rural Vermont needs a seat at the table, especially around um, this housing investment money that we've put into the budget. Uh, housing is another very important issue. Uh, housing prices in Lamal County and, and across the rest of the state. I think Lamal County was the second highest after Chittenden County as far as housing price increases um, over the last, uh, since COVID essentially uh, jumping nearly 10% a year. And I uh, I am a landlord and I have two, two rental properties. Um, both I try to keep uh, as affordable as I can and they're long-term rentals. And there's single moms in both units with, with kids and unlimited incomes. And uh, I just renewed the lease on, on one of them just, just last week and tried not, I did not increase the rent just to keep, try to keep things affordable for that, for that tenant um, who's struggling a little bit. Uh, I even offered to sell both, both homes to both of those rental units as, at an affordable rate. And they're both trying to do that. I, I, that's just at the personal level. Uh, at the statewide level, I think there, we probably have to do something about short-term rentals. And um, there's just a, a large increase in the amount of short-term rentals, uh, again, since COVID, and a lot of second homes. Um, I, I drive by uh, a lot of vacant homes as well and wondering if, if there could maybe be a, a potential program where some of these vacant homes can be purchased at, at, at a reduced rate and then those homes being renovated and weatherized um, and uh, being energy efficient and then turned around and, and sold or rented at, at a more modest modest level. I, um, I, I have uh, revitalized or renovated four different farmhouses uh, uh, for me and uh, personally and I think that could be could be done at the statewide level. The, the, the housing problem in Vermont is complex. The cost of it is, is, is in many ways tied to, um, you know, national trends in the cost of material, obviously labor costs, and there isn't, there isn't a whole lot of give in that system right now. Um, I, you know, probably part of the solution to make housing more affordable in Vermont is less regulation. I've served on the Development Review Board in Hyde Park for 20-some years. And, and over the course of that time, I've pointed out that, look, you know, you got all this zoning regulation and regulation of, of the construction industry and just regulation. And that drives up the cost of housing. Um, and, and if you're looking at the rental side of it, well, then, you know, the landlords who own the buildings are having to pay these ridiculous property taxes and they're needing to pass that on to their tenants. And so that's a cost driver as far as housing, rented housing goes. Um, you know, the, the sort of village centers idea uh, of, the, of the Democrats, you know, yeah, that's a good idea, but a lot of people don't want to live in the village centers. And so... Um, you know, I don't know, I don't know if that's particularly helpful in terms of, of housing costs, but, um, I think certainly less regulation and a general effort at making particularly taxes in Vermont more affordable because, you know, we don't just stagger under the weight of the, of the property tax. Our income taxes are pretty high too. And so 
less regulation, less spending, I think would translate into more moderate costs in, in, in housing. Again, another difficult um, issue for the state. We need to make housing affordable to get the younger folks in here to help uh, beef up our workforce. And I think we could do some uh, seriously relook at Act 250, the, the modifications that they made, I don't think made it easier to build more. I think we need to somehow get those that regulation streamlined so that the builders know what it's going to cost. They know what their permits are going to, what are required so they can get in, build, uh, take some of the, uh, if we can uh, lower some of the labor regulations might help us out a little bit. But we, uh, we uh, need to make um, housing affordable. And right now, the way the state's going, it's just, uh, I mean, I could sell my house for a fortune, but where would I go? <laughs> and it cost me twice as much to build a new house. So, and and I could be in a position that maybe a younger family could move into my house because I'm retired and I may want to try to downsize, but they they wouldn't be able to afford it. So, um, streamlining, relooking at Act 250. Let's relook at um, um, workmen's comp issues. All these things all need to be looked at to try to figure out and and make it. Uh, I think we need to l learn more to get more capitalistic in some of these solutions to uh, rather than government solutions. So, I mean, I think we really have to look at the underlying issues that a lot of um, Vermonters who are homeless um, are experiencing, whether it's mental health or uh, drug and alcohol uh, abuse, and you know try to figure out how to meet people where they are. Um, in the past, since COVID, we started using hotels. I think that's a pretty bad idea. I think what we need to do is have more congregate um, access to shelters where we have those wraparound services available to these individuals so that we can make sure that they're not um, in there for extended period of time. So let's figure out what the problems are. Let's see if we can get those addressed and either get folks into the workforce, uh, into more um, sustainable housing. But in a lot of cases, that's just not available. So we really need to continue to make those investments in affordable housing in our village centers and downtowns so that people do have a place to go and they do have uh, rental or the ability to, to get into something that they can afford. Um, the other thing um, that we saw a lot during COVID was that older Vermonters um, that are displaced out of their homes, we um, have not funded residential care facilities to the point where um, they're all going out of business. Our reimbursement rates are so low, they can't hire, st hire staff. And we actually have individuals living in hotel rooms who are receiving nursing home level of care through home health because there's no place for them to go. Our nursing homes are um, um, do not have the ability to attract um, staff and therefore they have empty beds. Our, like I said, our residential care, well, for example, in Hyde Park, um, the, the shelter that just opened was a residential care and they couldn't make it work. So we really, and this is something I've been working on since I've been in the legislature, is really looking at our home and community-based providers and trying to make sure that they have access to the funding they need to be able to deliver these services. Because having an older Vermonter living in a hotel, receiving nursing home level of care, we're a better world than that. That should not be. Again, that's a very important issue. Um, I think the motel program uh is, is is a is a good stop gap measure and and I th there's been recent caps on the allowed stay length of stay i believe it's 60 days now that's paid by the state um but it, it again it should only be considered a very short term stop get, gap measure and perhaps some some of the funding that was used to fund that longer than the 60 days could be used for a more uh, middle of the road step and uh, and addressing the big the big problem of the longer term fix of getting some affordable homes going. I know Morrisville 
has been putting up a lot of housing units, and some of them are for low and moderate income folks. Um, there may be some potential to uh, do some more programs like that uh, throughout throughout the state. And uh, but we we are struggling, and, and as I mentioned before, uh, renovating old farmhouses that are underutilized, um, having uh, seniors that are alone in some of these big homes um, have supporting programs uh, like that that keep uh, se seniors in their homes but maybe allow other people to share the home with the senior and and helping out help helping that elderly person out I think those are all good programs that we should fully support uh, so uh, you know that's an interesting way to to put the, that the governor is struggling with this problem I think anybody would struggle with this problem um, it's it's obviously it's a, a multifaceted problem. There probably there are people who are trying to work and aren't making enough money to pay for for housing. And they might have kids, and that's definitely something that we you know should address. From my observation, there's a pretty good part of the homeless population that clearly have psychiatric problems, and. At some point, it was decided in this country that wow, we need to we need to close down all the psychiatric institutions and mainstream the people, and I don't I don't think that particular experiment has worked out for us. And so, we need uh, psychiatric facilities. We need more psychiatric help for people. I think the drug problem is playing a huge role in 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 the homeless crisis and that's another thing that we need to deal with and i and i think part of the way to deal with that is with with law enforcement um i know that i have some disagreement from friends that i have that are in the the uh, you know the recovery end of that drug problem and and that's an honest disagreement you know should you put people that are involved in drugs in jail i think you should um but i'm certainly willing to have a discussion about that so um, spending all kinds of money uh, putting up homeless people in motel, mot we've spent an enormous amount of money in that in this state, like $400 million or something over, over the period of, of COVID. That's, that's a lot of money. Um, so we need to find, we need to find solutions for, for people who are struggling financially, have kids, we need psychiatric uh, facilities, and we need policing to end the drug problem. Well, the homeless population is growing, and I believe, uh, as with my running mate has said, that we have uh, some of those issues are, are have mental problems, and that the old-time Vermonters had this figured out. I mean, granted, there may have been with the state hospitals, and I believe there was three levels. There was people who needed a place to stay. They needed, and the next level would be the uh, that weren't able to make these decisions to be in a in a in a out in the field. Then another level was they needed per, they needed help maintaining their medication, and they got a little more. Um, they were more um, supervised. supervised. And then the other one was where um, they just had to be secured and monitored on a daily basis. And I think we sort of need to go back to that where we can uh, build in homeless shelters uh, if, if there's that kind of um, structure in it might work. But um, we just need... Um, go back to where the old timers had kind of figured this solution out originally and, and putting all these folks out in the in main uh, closing them down and moving them out was not was not a solution. Yeah, there's no doubt that um, road construction, you look at the price of replacing a bridge now or paving a mile of road it is astronomical. And in fact, if you looked at that section between Johnson and Cambridge, um, you know, we allocated funding just to repair that piece of road um, back four years ago. And the bids came in like double what we had allocated in the legislature. So I, I don't quote me on the double. It was way more than we had allocated. So we had to figure out where we were going to come up with more funding, whether it's the state um, and federal funding combined. One thing that we can use state dollars to draw down federal dollars 
for roads like Route 15. Um, our biggest match, obviously, is our interstates, but we do have a match on our secondary roads like Route 15 or Route 100 to kind of offset the cost because they are so expensive now to maintain these roads. And we also live in an area where we have a lot of freeze and thaw and the roads, you know, as you know, they start to come apart. Um, in terms of municipalities, and for instance, we just had this um, this big flood a year before the last one, you know, a lot of washouts up high, um, a lot of um, brooks that don't run all the time took roads out. You know, if you drive down Route 12 and you look where the road got washed out, there's no water in those brooks on a regular day. It's just when we have these really big flood events. So um, we need to really look at our culverts. We need to look at the alignment, the road ditching and how um, how our roads are constructed, um, which we've been we've been really working on having culvert inventories and making sure that um, they are um built correctly to be able to take these uh, catastrophic flooding events that we've been having because we can't afford to keep fixing them. We just have to build them right. But unfortunately, that's expensive. Um, also, back to your question about uh, where the money is going to come from, especially as people stop driving, um, really um, start driving more efficient cars, which is important uh, to be able to get to work and to have affordability. But that's also our gas tax. So, you know, they are starting to look at how we're going to fund to cars all electric. How is, you know, they're not really paying to use the roads. So we're going to have to figure out a system that is equitable to be able to make sure that um, we all are paying to use the infrastructure that we have so that we can have the money to draw down federal funds to pay for our roads. Very appropriate question, given our, our recent flood last week, um, Lamal County and Hardwick uh, have been hit by three different floods in the last year. Uh, I, as, I, as I mentioned, my background, I was a Municipal Roads Stormwater Program Manager. I established the road and bridge standards for the state of Vermont. Um, I am currently working with the town of Woolcott as a volunteer to help them bring their roads up to the standards, which would make their roads more flood resilient by putting in uh, drainage ditch, better drainage ditch, ditch uh, practices, upsizing culverts, uh, removing high road shoulders and, and things of that nature. Uh, there's a lot of good programs with the state of Vermont in uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation doing floodplain restoration. There rivers, when rivers can't access their floodplain, they cause a lot of erosion damage. And uh, where we have some uh, vacant lots or abandoned uh, fallow farm fields where we can allow the river to access their floodplain and take some of that pressure off the stream banks and off of properties in the built environment like downtown Hardwick and Woolcott and Cambridge and Johnson that are struggling. Uh, there's selective buyouts uh, with FEMA that should still be supported that need town approval. Um, and uh, there, there are lots of other measures we can. As far as the funding for uh, some climate change projects, uh, we uh, I we are seeing uh, there's a bill to support charging uh, electric car owners um, a fee because they don't have to fill up their tanks. Uh, I, I would support that, um, but also support more electric cars on the road at the same time um, as well. And uh, potentially t uh, tying, having a, a gas tax um, increase tied to inflation so that that, that can go up uh, as as uh, infl as as the price that the, as we're seeing reduced uh, income from that gas tax, uh, but at the same time, I want to make sure it's not uh, a regressive tax that impacts low and in uh, low and moderate income Vermonters. Um, I'm not at all convinced that electric vehicles will will take over uh, from internal combustion vehicles until that technology is perfected. The batteries are heavy. Uh, mining the, the materials, the lithium for the batteries is a super water intensive uh, process called evaporative mining. Um, it's environmentally very unfriendly. I don't think that we have adequate electricity. If we were to change to all, everybody had an electric vehicle today, we wouldn't have the power to run them. Um, they're not good when they catch on fire. I think that that technology needs to be developed further uh, uh, before it before it's embraced by the whole country. I, I, I don't think that the sales of electric cars are doing very well right now. 
And I think that might be a market response to these, we're not ready for this. Uh, am I for electric vehicles? Absolutely. 500 horsepower electric pickup, perfect. Um, as long as it doesn't have a 5,000 pound battery made of a material that's, that's difficult and destructive to mine and that the fire department can't put out if it catches on fire. Um, the resiliency thing, uh, you know, there's the river science. And the river science seems to dictate that, well, we need the, the river to do what it wants to do and it can spread out and, and slow down the velocity of the water and, and everything will be fine. I think we need to dredge the rivers. I think we could use com uh, computer modeling to, to, to inform us as to where that dredging would take place. Um, and if there are areas that we can flood without destroying farmers' fields or destroying our villages, then we can do that. But I, and um, we have not kept up with our road infrastructure, culverts and bridges, and that all needs to be fixed anyway. This was brought up at our, one of our, uh, I, was, I served on the transportation board and we brought, that issue was brought up about electric vehicles and my response to the, one of the, the state employee given the, the, the uh, seminar that we were listening to, I just said, we need to, you need to figure out how you're gonna get the equivalent tax that a gas running vehicle pays and the registration. So if you need to make the registration a thousand dollars a year, and then they got to pay another uh, surcharge on top of that because they are electric, they are still using the roads just like the gas vehicles, and they need to pay their fair share. And I don't want to subsidize it. They, um, and again, I'm not against people having electric cars or going green, but I don't want to. I I don't think we can afford to subsidize it anymore. The, uh, the electric system now, solar, where people now have to pay 26 cents a kilowatt, the utilities have to pay 26 cents a kilowatt, that just, that is not competitive. They can buy uh, their power they need from gas or Hydro-Quebec for six, seven, eight cents a kilowatt, and it's just throwing the whole thing out of, out of whack. Um, versus, and we need to maintain, make sure that the taxes coming in are fixing, used to fix the bridges and fix the roads and not go doing extra stuff that really doesn't relevant to get people to get moved around in the state. And as for um, the um, resilience to the towns with the, with the change, the flooding, I agree with my running mate. He, we, I believe that we need to start doing we need to be talking to A&R and say, we need to run some test, test areas about dredging out some of these rivers. They're all filled with the silt and gravel, and they used to do it way back in the old, olden days. The towns would go in there and scoop them out. They'd make the big holes for the trout to be able to get in. And uh, you could use a brook. The brooks are no longer, the brooks used to stay pretty narrow, and now they're, like massively wide because of river science. They say they got to let the river go where they are. And I don't, I don't believe that. I think we should be doing some, uh, having those discussions with A&R and say, let's go in and do, let's take a strip of the river where we really have some issues and let's try dredging them out and see if that helps us out down the road at the next event. So I supported the constitutional amendment to uh, um, protect reproductive freedom in our state. It started in our, it was in our committee. I supported it there. Um, and then I supported it on the floor. I think that we have um, really moved forward in by putting it in our constitution to protect a woman's right and make this a decision between their healthcare provider and themselves. Um, I think that uh, we have done a really good job at making sure that that is protected in our state. Um, it, nationally, um, you got me. I'm uh, I'm really focusing on our our issues here, and uh, I think we have uh, we have kind of dealt with that um, by putting it in our constitution. Uh, I fully support uh, women's access uh, to abortion, uh, reproductive rights for women, 
I think that decision is between a, a woman and her physician and family, uh, and that uh, there shouldn't be any any controls at the state or federal level in that regard. So, I, I, and, and I believe the legislature um, just passed a bill last session to support that, given some of the Supreme Court decisions. Uh, I don't. I don't personally believe that the government has any place. Um, telling a woman that she's either going to have a baby or not going to have a baby. I just don't think that, uh, I don't think that that's the role of government. Um, I think Vermont has done quite a good job of protecting uh, women's rights. You know, I have a wife, I have a daughter, I love women, you know, I care about women. And so, I, and I, and I think that, I think that, you know, the public would find that a surprising number of Republicans would just as soon have the, the abortion issue just go away. Um, you know, do you have to have some regulation? Probably you do. But, but I would imagine that all sorts of, of uh, medical procedures have regulations that are agreed upon between the, the politicians and the, and the medical community. And uh, so uh, that the Supreme Court decision, perfect. So you guys decided that it was up to the states. Um, maybe it should be up to the states. I, I can't really answer that question, but as far as a woman's right to uh, make her own choices for her body, that's, that's where I'm at, not the government. This is a, another issue that's a, it's a tough one, but in the state of Vermont, I believe they have, uh, we have, the, peop the people have spoke, we've adjusted the Constitution, and we have the uh, statutes there to protect the woman. And to me, in this election for my house seat, it's not it's a non-issue. The uh, on the nation nationwide basis, I I do agree with the Supreme Court. I think it was a state's issue. It's a state's issue to decide what they want to do. Yeah. So um, one of my um, I guess I would consider it a win for this legislative session was um, many low-income older Vermonters when they turn sixty-five. Um, and they're on Medicaid, they transition to Medicare, and we have a program. So when they're on Medica uh, Medicaid, um, they don't have any, they don't have co-pays, they have access to care, but as soon as they turn 65, they cannot be on that program anymore. And all of a sudden they have co-pays and deductibles for Medicare. So this program is called Medicare Savings. Um, and the um, eligibility for it was so low that when people got an increase in their social security benefits, they became ineligible for the program. So I had people that went and got a $6 increase in their social security, which put them over the limit. And then they had to spend $3,000 a year for healthcare. Now I'm talking about people that live on $24,000 a year. So these are low income, older Vermonters, and we were able to increase the eligibility for that program to make sure that they had access to health care so that they didn't have to make a choice between food and getting uh, going to a doctor's appointment or getting their medications. Because when they show up in the ER or if they cannot um, maintain their health, they're going to end up in a nursing home. And that is our most expensive care. Um, and just by having people get increased in Social Security, we hadn't really done anything about the eligibility for this program in years. So uh, it's been something I've been working on uh, with other legislators in our um, and we were able to move it this year. So uh, I'm pretty pretty proud about that, seeing that bill pass and um, how this will this will help about 16,000 older Vermonters have access to health care. Yes, I, th I think there needs to be some common sense uh, in the state house. And I'm, I'm a very practical person, I'm open minded. I'm willing to hear all sides of an issue. I'm work willing to work with Republicans, with the governor, with progressives, um, not necessarily vote party line. For on every issue, I think that's important that we that we are open minded and we we have we keep things civil. We work with the other side. Uh, we we go out uh, f for lunch with with people we may not agree with, and at least hear hear their side uh, and 
and hopefully come up with some middle ground where we can get get some stuff done. And I think if the Dem if the Democrats lose their super, super majority in the state house this year, as some are indicating, uh, that will force uh, Democrats and Republicans to work together to get get some bills passed and across the governor's desk and uh, avoid a veto. Well, you know, the river science thing, Ricketson's uh, farm is on the way from Morrisville to Stowe. There's a beautiful field across the street from the farmhouse and the barn. And we'd always, we would get stuck behind them because they'd always be driving that herd across the road there when you were going home from work and so you'd have to sit and wait for the cows. If you go by that field and look over there now, there's all these debarked trees out in the, in the middle of the field and there's this huge sandbar and it's destroyed. You go up the North Wolcott Road, same thing. It's the, the, the wild branches chewed into the road. It used to be really good trout fishing. Friends of mine grew up there. There's no trout anymore. So I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm unsure of the river science. Throughout the course of human history, there's been all kinds of science and some of it was decided to be irrelevant. And I, I have a feeling that we need to take a closer look at the science of the river science. Um, and then the energy, the energy thing, you know, renewable energy, perfect. We're gonna, we're gonna tax people's fuel in a state that's already wicked overburdened with taxes. And, and we're worried about housing and costs and stuff, so we're gonna make our energy more <laughs> expensive. That's just not what you would do. And, and so I'm a big proponent of nuclear power. Nuclear power has the highest power density for the smallest footprint. And I suspect, I don't know this, but I suspect that nuclear power will probably turn out to be the most environmentally responsible form of power that, that there is. We have tons of spent fuel all over this country. The French, have, the French get 70, 80% of their electric energy from nuclear, and they have always recycled their fuels. Most, all the fuel that we have is still 95% viable. And, and you, people are trying, well, we'll bury it in the ground here and we'll do this. We should reburn that fuel so that future generations don't have to deal with that problem. And in the process of doing that, we could have abundant power. Because I am of the mind that rather than trying constantly to conserve power so that we're shivering in the dark, let's figure out how to make a lot of power so that everybody can have power and that'll power our economy and increase our standard of living. Thank you. I would, uh, I would like to just let folks know that with my business background, I think it's lacking down in Montpelier and we need to look at some capitalistic solutions to some of these problems rather than tax and spend. We've been going down this road and the taxes have gone up horrendously. I know when I moved, first moved into Hyde Park, I think my taxes were $1,000 this year. It's almost $7,800 and that's over since 1993 and it's just constantly been going up. We need to figure out how to, uh, I mean, there's stuff that we need to look at um, one of my proposals would be we should freeze the budget, the state budget for 10 years and make that um, make the government work with that money and just say the departments, you guys have to figure it out. We can't afford anymore. Let's let's try it and see what happens. I mean, you do have that option in doing the Budget Adjustment Act every year, and if you run into some troubles, we might be able to try to adjust a little bit. But the idea that uh, compared to New Hampshire, their population versus our population and their budget versus our budget is just way out of whack. And uh, I think if you did that 10-year freeze, you would see maybe bringing it more, would come back in line where it would make it affordable for people to live here.